Every second, seven people die. By the time you put your head on your pillow tonight, over 600,000 people have walked off into eternity. Heaven or hell as we speak. Got a very simple question for you. Do you care? Much tougher question though. Do you care enough to do something about it? Because trust me on the simple fact, if you do not care enough to do something about it, trust me, you do not care. And I'll go ahead and tell you, that's the problem we got with the American church today. We swear to the high heavens we care where all these people are going to spend eternity, but I don't care enough to get in a conversation with my next door neighbor, with one of my friends from high school. Think about that. What's it going to take for you to get out of your comfort zone? What have we done? We've, we've formed a type of Christianity that did not exist 2,000 years ago. We've made sharing our faith an optional part of Christianity. It was never an optional part. It was what we were living for to see six billion people saved. Does your heart beat that way? What's it going to take to get out of your comfort zone? I want to talk today about what it means to send out laborers into this harvest field and what it means to be a sending church. Sometimes you've heard me say that as, uh, the job of elders is really four rhyming words, to mend, tend, Fend and send, right? We mend people, biblical counseling, discipleship. We hopefully help heal the most destructive, detrimental thing in your life, which is the sin areas or relationship struggles, and that's a lot of biblical counseling. We fend. We fend off false doctrine and threats to our thinking, because as we think is so also how we act. But we then also tend. We hopefully lead you to be tended to to get into good pasture, to be feeding yourself on the Word of God and prayer and and to get you exercising those spiritual muscles, not where you only just know the word, but you're actually living it out and being a doer of the word. But one thing I don't think churches do a real good job is sending. And that is the Bible says, equipping you for every good work. And it says, laboring with all God's energy, Colossians 1.28. It says, to, till everyone is, is mature in Christ. And where we're producing our own deacons and elders and evangelists and church planners and missionaries, how many churches are really sending forth out workers into this harvest field? And I think the problem is, is that most Christians think, oh, that's what we hire the pastor for, right? We, that's what we hire, we send the missionaries for is, you know, the evangelist does all the evangelizing, the, the missionaries do all the missionar missionizing or whatever, the pastors do all the teaching. They're just a new word for you today, all right? It's missionizing, Chad Laird, right there, no, 1130, uh, uh, March uh, 29th. Uh, but uh, I would say, are we sending and reproducing ourselves spiritually? And here's the difference. My prayer is for this church that the Lord would help the elders equip you where you see I may be that next deacon. I may be that next pastor, that church planner. I may be called where my hope and prayer for you is that all of you consider what's my role. Because I truly believe the, the growth of churches is so hindered because 10% of the people are doing all the ministry usually, and about 1% of the church is doing all the evangelizing. But the key for explosive growth we see in the book of Acts, like in the Tuesday class, where it says they went from 120 in chapter 120 people in the upper room in chapters 1 and 2, and then 3,000 in chapter 2, and then 5,000 in 3 and 4, and, and it says God was continuing to add to their number daily. The difference, I think, with that is that every Christian got the vision that says, I'm to be a spiritual reproducer. And I think if all of us led, as you've heard me say, one person of Christ every year, it'd be exciting to see that I have, you know, my, you know, if you're a man, you have another man, you've reproduced yourself spiritually. If you're a woman, another woman or your children and say, where is our fruit, each of us individually? And I want to talk about saying, if you want to be an effective evangelist, if you want to have that kind of growth, we want to be like the book of Acts and have that kind of uh, spiritual reproduction, it's not just the job of Calvin and Dennis and Chad and, and Jim and Adam and Kevin and some of our deacon candidates. It is all of us making the most of every opportunity where it's your job. There are some Christians, the elders will never have, an, or some unbelievers will never have a chance as the elders to talk to them. You've got the mission. It's you. It's all on you. You're the one who has that angle, that relationship, to, that, to br the, build the bridge of relationship to carry over the gospel to them. And I would say, how well are we doing that? I, I've heard a recent statistic that, uh, you know, you've heard me say less than 5% of Christians ever share or lead someone to Christ. There's a recent study that said less than 2% of Christian men have ever shared their faith or witness to someone ever. 
Wow. So this is what I want to talk. How do we become a sending church? How do we become that kind of church where it's not just the, the few, the proud, the brave. It's all of us making the most of every opportunity. That's what I want to talk about today. So as we study uh, Matthew chapter 9, we come to this section. I just want you to be asking yourself, Lord, how can I be fully utilized for your kingdom? In my short little life, Lord, help me to lead at least one person to Christ. In my short little life, how can I be the most utilized for the kingdom of God? I want to talk about that today. So as you know, we're in the Chronological Life of Christ series. We're going through the all four Gospels together. And we're coming to the section where Jesus is now going to heal two blind men. He's going to heal a, a mute man possessed by a demon. He's then going to re-engage with the Pharisees, saying he's casting out these demons by the power of Beelzebub, this ad hominem attack, this personal attack that just avoids the real issue and just try to, tries to cut him down personally. We're then going to see that he goes on from there, and he then makes this statement that says, pray the Lord sends out workers into his workers' field because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are what? Few. Can I say to you as loving as I can, all of you are the workers. Let me say that again. How many of you? All of you are the workers. And the workers are few. But do you really believe the harvest of souls is plentiful? Do you really believe that? I truly believe, he says, the fields are white in the harvest. It's, they're, they're, they're ready to be harvested. There are people who I believe are open to the gospel. And we, some, oh, they can't, no one can be open to the gospel. Everyone hates Jesus. Not so. And so I would say, are you making the most of every opportunity to be faithful to your Lord in the Great Commission? We want to talk about that today. So how are you? How are you doing as far as being uh, mended, fended, right? And uh, tended, but also sended. There's another word for you, right? I had to get that in there. Okay. Let's go on. Some of you know, if you want to download the notes, uh, use the password, go to our website, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'd appreciate that. As we come to this section in the Galilean ministry, we come really to focus on belief versus unbelief because Jesus is going to go from Capernaum where he around this area where he raises Jairus' 12-year-old daughter from the dead, and he's going to heal these two blind men. He's going to heal this mute man and then have this uh, re-engagement with the Pharisees. And then he's going to travel from Capernaum to Nazareth where we see an ultimate rejection of his hometown of the gospel. And so we see great belief from these, these, these blind men who say, Son of David, have mercy on us, which is exactly the kind of heart cry it takes to become a believer today where he says, if you believe I'm able to do this, says your faith will make you well, to, ah, oh, this, this is just the carpenter's son. So this great contrast between belief and unbelief, these three miracles, what are those three miracles? Two blind men, both of those I count as one or two, and this demon man who could never speak, him healed, but then not much going on in Nazareth. Why? Because of their unbelief. And a sad, sad thing. So if we set the stage for this, uh, really, Jesus is going from Capernaum back to Nazareth, his hometown. And Matthew 9 says that Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Let me remind you again, is that we don't preach our best life now. You're heaven here on earth, that Jesus wants you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Right, that's prosperity gospel. We preach the kingdom of God, the true gospel. Your best life is in the coming kingdom. That is a thousand years here on this earth, the millennial reign, where Christ will reign from Jerusalem on the throne of David, and he'll rule over all the nations of the earth. All the land boundaries of Israel will be fulfilled, going back to his promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. All the promises to David about a king who will sit on his throne, whose kingdom will never end, that will come true. And we know that that kingdom goes on to all of eternity, to a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, where in that time, that finally will be no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. That is what we preach, my friends, and that is good news. Amen? Are you preaching that kingdom? Have you talked to anybody about that kingdom? It's not how to have your best 401k. It's not your house is here. It's not your jobs here. It's not your health in these corrupt bodies. This is a cursed fallen world. Our hope is not here. Are you telling about the real hope? The real king? The real promise of something we have to look forward to? And so that's the setting. You can see in the upper right that this is a picture of modern day Capernaum. 
where the old synagogue is there behind the structure they've built over Peter's house, which is probably the house where Jesus was coming back into, as we read in this passage, the, where many were surrounding this house where he did all these miracles from. Or the bottom right is modern day Nazareth, and you can just see how much has expanded, where the circle really shows how big it was in Jesus' time. Very, very small. Very, very insignificant. So Jesus is going throughout, he's proclaimed the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Why? Because that is indicative of what the kingdom will be like. Will there be any disease or demons or problems in the kingdom? No, and so those who are, are all millennials who don't believe in a literal kingdom of God, they think we're in the kingdom now. Do you see disease in this world? Do you see demon activity in this world? Do you see Jesus reigning on the throne of David right now and peace throughout the world and all the nations coming and worshiping Jesus? Of course not. So that is a completely bogus view of eschatology. But it is the primary view of the Catholics, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, all the mainline denominations. And that's why we would say, if this is the kingdom, I am sorely disappointed. If this is the kingdom, man, what, what, how did this happen? Wow, some great promise. But Jesus is giving the hope of a kingdom and he's expressing what will be indicative of the kingdom. No disease, demons, uh, disaster, physical disasters, etc. And now this, I love this, for evangelism. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And so we are going to talk today about the compassion at heart is required. The only way it's going to motivate you guys more in evangelism is if you truly love the lost. You truly have a care about their soul, where they spend it in heaven or hell. And I would, can I say with you today, we don't care enough. We care more about our reputations, what people think of us, than their soul, which will spend eternity even in hell. And hell and eternity is a long time, would you admit? So why do we care more what people think of us than what God thinks of us? Why are we so focused on all other things except for the Great Commission? When is the last time you've witnessed anybody? When is the last time you've had an opportunity to share the full gospel to somebody? I was encouraged to hear of someone in our church this week who uh, literally used that word, I had a chance to share with my relative the full gospel. Praise the Lord. And may we pray and ask God to give that day every week because that is what we're here for. Uh, Mark Cahill, I'm going to end with in our conclusion, a video by him. He wrote a great book, The One Thing We Can't Do in Heaven. And he says, the one thing we can't do in heaven is evangelism. That is the main mission we have as believers here on earth. Have we forgotten the mission? Are you focused on yourself and the temporary things that really don't matter? Or are you about the Father's business with this kind of heart of compassion? So he's going through all of Galilee, and that's the, the stage that we set here. If you uh, see this, he's traveled now by foot, and Google, Google tells me it takes about nine and a half hours to walk there. So anybody gone on a 27-mile walk recently? All right? Got in about a you know, 10, 15-mile bike ride yesterday. Cold, by the way. Cold, cold, cold. So I have nothing to complain about. I had a bike. Jesus had, had two wheels uh, called us two feet. We call those uh, in the infantry, we call them your dogs. Man, my dogs are tired, right? Because, you know, I've just been on them all day. But that's the setting to see how Jesus might have walked there. That's the setting that we're looking for. 27 miles of fun and fellowship on your dogs or on your wheels a lot. All right? We'll look at uh, some... Uh, some of these other things here. Let's look at uh, Matthew 9, which uh, Josh read earlier, that we should be seeching the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Have you been praying for your missionaries? Have you been praying God would raise up uh, among, to, to utilize us all as evangelists, but also even to raise up those evangelists in the office to go throughout America, to go throughout the world, specifically with the mission of evangelizing? That's something we don't pray about as much, and we need to beseech the Lord. And then we're going to look at Mark 6, but before sake of time, we'll look at this rejection in Mark 6, also in Matthew 13. So the title of my message today is Effective Evangelism. Five essentials for effective evangelism. What, what, for what purpose? So that we send out workers from TBC into the plentiful harvest. Five essentials for effective evangelism. I'm going to give you five main points for sending out workers, even from this church, into the plentiful harvest of souls. We better get with it for sake of time. 
The first point, effective evangelism requires, so all five points are going to have this phrase, effective evangelism requires, here's the first thing, the first thing it requires is interacting with the lost. So, some people are Christian isolationists. They have separated every bit of their lives where the only people they know, whether they're kids or themselves, is Christians. Can I tell you, we are not called to do that. We are not called to be Christian isolation. We are to call, be called Christian interactionists. There's my other third word for the day, right? right? And you know, I'm all full of new words here. But if you, never, if you don't know any unbelievers, you are not building a relationship with unbelievers, I, I will tell you, don't be surprised if you never win any unbelievers. You don't, how many of you, if a stranger came up to you in a mall and quote-unquote witnessed you and says, hey, I, you know, you're single, said, hey, I've got a mail-order bride. You have five seconds. I want you to just to choose and get married to a person you've never met and a stranger is producing this. Would you accept that there on the spot? Why do we think then sometimes that we come and witness the strangers in a mall witness? And, and not that that's bad with youth groups, but I would say we consider things, we count the cost, and that takes place in the context of relationships of people we trust, Amen. And so it's relational evangelism. And that's what we see Jesus doing is he interacted with the lost. He interacted with the lowly of lowlies. He was not afraid to touch the unclean and get his hands dirty, being with those that culture and society rejected. But how many Christians are like, oh, that person's poor or that person's dirty or that person, you know, is not very smart or that person, if I'm hanging around them, that would really kind of, you know, that's just not the kind of people I want to hang out with. It says that Jesus was going on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, have mercy on us, son of David. And when he entered the house, the blind men came up to him and Jesus said, do you believe I'm able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. He touched their eyes and this key phrase, it shall be done according to your faith. Their eyes were opened and then Jesus sternly warned them not to tell anybody about that, but the news spread throughout the land. So I want to focus on three phrases. Have mercy on us. Do you believe I'm able to do this? and it shall be done according to your faith, all right? So three key phrases. Let's look at the first one. Have mercy on us. This Greek word means to have pity, to have compassion, to, to show a merciful attitude towards. I think we lack that, and can I just challenge you, if you lack that with the lost, you've seen too many, you know, uh, you know pictures of, of uh, you know, world vision type things, on, and you're like, oh, you know, that's just trying to move me. Yeah, to, uh, and, and you no longer have a compassion for those who are not fed or, or clothed. I can say to you, my heart has been hardened at times. Well, I mean, you can't manipulate me into the, doing that. I can't possibly reach everybody, so I'm not going to do anything. I told you that the, the saddest thing, we were at a concert uh, one day was uh, they were doing a Compassion International in the, in the break time, and guys were going to the Newsboys concert tonight. I'm sure they might do something tonight. And one guy, you could feel the Lord really put on his heart, and he stood up. To, to then, you know, to, to, to take one of the envelopes, in that case in the concert, and I remember the wife taken by the belt and pulling him down. That was sad. But you know what was my, maybe even sadder? Was the Chad and Marissa who never stood up to begin with. And I could say, oh, we have about that, and I have my giving elsewhere, but did I really have my giving elsewhere? And your discretionary income, what do you do with your discretionary income? How much of your discretionary income do you really give towards anyone but you? I say this to myself. I'm the first one to check this area. Do I have a mercy, a compassion, a heart that truly is not about myself and my comforts and having the comfortable Christian life? It's really focused on Christ and others. Do I really have that, that compassion, that mercy? We see the son of David, it's a messianic title, going back to Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, where it says the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This was a title the Jews knew, referred to the Messiah, the Mashiach, the anointed one of God. Second phrase, do you believe I'm able to do this? This word is uh, pistuo, which is where we get, is out of the root word of faith. Do you really believe and entrust yourself to Jesus? Do you really have faith and absolute confidence in him that you are committing to be faithful to him? That's the word faith. That's the word believe. And he said, he's, Jesus is telling him, do you really believe this? And do you believe I'm dunamai, that I'm dynamite, that that's where we get the word dynamite, dunamos, 
where we see Dunamai to be, am I, do you believe he's able to do the impossible, to have the power to save you, in their case from blindness, but in our case from sin, whereas Dennis rightly preached, can you say, Hosanna, deliver me now, Lord, from my sin, because that is my greatest enemy. Do you believe he's able to do this? And I like that. Simply, yes, Lord. We believe you're able. If you truly believe he's able, TBC, why don't you ask of him more in prayer to do the impossible if you truly think he's able? Chad Laird, if you truly believe that all that the passage says, if you ask anything according to his name, he will do it, why aren't you going to that unlimited ATM and making more, and making more withdrawals in that unlimited resource of, through prayer? Begs the question, do I truly believe? Do I truly have the compassion? Do I really have the heart of God when it comes to evangelism? And then, of course, this word, it shall be done according to your faith, literally says, according to the faith of you, it shall be done to you. And I would say to you, TBC, according to the prayer of you, it shall be done to you. The measure of your prayer is probably the measure of the output of the, of the fruit that lasts that you'll experience in your life. You pray little, you will probably reap little in the harvest. Where is our faith? And I think this is insight, if I can pull all this together. I think this does give us insight how someone receives the gospel message. Number one, they have to have a genuine, heartfelt, earnest plea for mercy or forgiveness from God. That's what repentance is. True repentance. Number two, there must be a genuine belief and trust and commitment to Jesus as Lord, believing that he is God, he is able or dynamite with God's power to do the impossible, even saving us from the wrath and judgment of God to come. And three, that the promise of the gospel is that anyone who repents and puts their faith in Jesus to save them from their sin shall be saved. Meaning that there's a correlation and a condition of salvation that while God has decreed sovereignly that salvation is available to all, his death was sufficient for everyone who ever lived and every sin that ever happened, it will only be transacted and applied to those who have faith. As this beautiful phrase, phrase says here, according to the faith of you, it shall be done to you. Or as Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace you have been saved, but let's not forget, Calvinist, through what? Faith. So when people say it's all of God and you have no part in the gospel, that is not true. You have a part and responsibility to receive it by faith. The scripture is so clear on that. So that's the first point. And then very briefly, it says here, a kind of a strange thing that I mentioned last week, we see Jesus sternly warning them not to tell anybody. Why would Jesus do this? And uh, sometime, I urge you, sometime, I, I think it's a very good website, gotquestions.org. They had a very good response here, why Jesus did this. He says, Jesus knew that publicity might hinder his mission and divert public attention from his message. It wasn't about the miracles themselves for this temporary life. It was about the king and the gospel message of the life to come. Isn't that the real focus? And isn't that the problem with a lot of charismania churches? The focus is on themselves and the physical here and now and not on the Christ and the king and not on the message of the kingdom to come, is it? That's the distraction of Satan we must also be aware of. That's why Jesus warned him. It's not about the hysteria of the here and now. It's about the king and the kingdom to come. That should be our focus. And any distraction from that, he would sternly warn us against as well. Jesus did not also want people focusing on the miracles themselves, but rather on the message he proclaimed and the death he was going to die. The same is true today. God would rather that we be focused on the healing miracle of salvation through Jesus Christ instead of focusing on the healings or the miracles that are only temporary and don't guarantee eternal salvation. It, it, it doesn't do, do you any good if you were healed physically with good eyes or whatever infirmity, only then to spend all eternity in hell. Would that really miracle do you any good? No. And so sometimes I wonder if Satan actually doesn't do true miracles with the faith healers to distract people from really saying, it's all what Jesus does for me. They're really not repentant. They're not really believing. They don't really love the Christ and the kingdom. They just want the genie to make their life the way they want it for themselves. They may be healed momentarily and then say, oh, look at this faith healer and all this stuff. But th could they hear the words, Lord, Lord? Didn't we not do all these things, cast out demons in your names, perform many miracles? And Jesus said to them, I never what? Knew you, you who practice lawlessness. You got a miracle, but you never repented. You never lived for me. Let's go on to point number two. First, secondly, is uh, 
Effective evangelism requires engaging in spiritual warfare. Engaging in spiritual warfare. Because it wasn't just about this mute man. It was about the demon behind the mute man. Let's take a look at that. We see this word in Greek means blunt or dull. He was deaf. He was dumb, not in the sense of not being smart, but dumb meant mute. He could not speak. And I would say to you, if you could not speak, we do not realize what a world that would be. Dr. Moore writes this, the poor man is afflicted with both demon possession and dumbness. The word uh, kaphos can indicate deafness, dumbness, or both. They are often connected. If someone is born deaf, they are bound to have difficulty speaking. It would appear that, demon, that the demon causes this man's physical disability. But that is not to say that all physical demon, or disabilities are caused by demons. That's important. Jesus doesn't respond to the Pharisees' accusation, at least not here. However, the same accusation is then made again that they say this man, he then frees from this deafness and demons he was doing by the power of Satan. We know that that's not true, but I would say to us, do you have a, a picture that when you go in to witness someone, it is a spiritual battle? I think we can be reminded this week. This is in the French Alps. This is the temporary memorial you heard this week. I personally believe that almost every mass murder is demon-possessed. I don't believe that you could have the guy up in Connecticut kill all those kids and not be possessed by Satan who loves to kill, steal, and what? Destroy. This man is interesting. I said to Marissa, I said, I think this guy was demon-possessed. Watch, it'll come out. Did you know that just a couple days ago, this is what was said. I'm not going to mention the guy's name because I don't want to give him any notoriety. That his girlfriend said that he said earlier, you're going to know me as famous someday because I'm going to reset everything in the airline industry. He predicted that earlier. And then also his girlfriend said that the reason, one of the reasons she left him the day before the plane flight is because he would wake up in the middle of the night screaming, we are going down. And because of his constant nightmares. Sounds like a demon to me, isn't it? I truly believe that. And she said this. She said, he knew how to hide from others what was really going on inside. Wow. How do you kill 150 people and hear their cries for eight minutes and you remain silent and your breath, your breath rate, heart rate does not even increase at all? Answer, demon possession. I truly believe that you may disagree with me. I believe we'll find out why, because it says in Ephesians, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but a what? Against the rulers, powers, forces of darkness in this world, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly realms. Therefore, arm up, TBC. Get your armor on so that you'll be able to resist an evil day and have, having done everything to stand that defensive position. Thirdly, effective evangelism requires enduring personal attacks. What happened after Jesus then releases this, this man from demonic possession? He gets a ad hominem attack, a personal attack that deflects from the real issue here. A slander, a smear campaign saying that he's doing this by the power of Satan. And I would say to you, if you want to effectively evangelize, you not only have to get your hands there and interact with unbelievers, you not only have to engage in spiritual warfare, which means you better be a man or a woman of prayer and much prayer because Satan will attack you, but then be ready for the pushback, as I call it. The greatest depression and struggle in my life came after our greatest victory of, of evangelizing door to door for two weeks. And then I had the, the worst struggle in my thought life and my marriage I've ever had. Get armed up. MacArthur, I was listening to a sermon this week. He says, after any spiritual victory, he prays the most afterwards, knowing that that, it says, be careful lest you think you stand, lest you what? Fall. And get armed up. Because here is the pushback. Pharisees accusing the Jesus casting out the demons by the power of Satan. So beware of the counterattack. And the enemy who, if he has one enemy, it will always be in the area of evangelism. Why? He can't get you back. You're safe in the arms of the Lord and, and double-handed uh, by the Father. No one can separate you out of his hand, John 10. But he will do anything, anything to keep you from stealing more of his sheep from his pen. Anything. And that's what's going on here. 
these personal attacks, uh, uh, the Wikipedia says ad hominem attack is Latin for to the man or to the person. It's short for uh, an argumentation that attacks a person's character rather than the content of their arguments. That's exactly what the Pharisees are doing here. MacArthur writes there, MacArthur writes, the Pharisees had seen enough of Jesus' power to know it was God's power, but in their willful unbelief, they said his was the power of Satan. They, they knew it. I want to, I want to tell you, the, one of the things I struggle the most with is my reputation, which is a concern of what people think of me, and I care too much of what people think of me. So when we've taken a stand on a couple of things, and I heard back that at some at other churches called me the spawn of Satan, all right, I was greatly despondent about that. But should I be? No. Marissa recently was called something very terrible by a so-called Christian person. And I would say, we will struggle with our reputation, and that's part of the smear campaign. It's part of anything to do to keep you from evangelizing. And I would say, resist it, my friends. Be very careful also, then, I would say, about receiving an evil report about another Christian. I've passed out this uh, article to a lot of people recently. How to guard against the defilement of listening to an evil report. If anyone comes and says to you an evil or very negative thing about another Christian, can I say to you, let's get armed up about this, people. I hear sometimes slander from, I heard some slander about another pastor in the community. And I'm thinking, because I'm competitive and I want to be the greatest you know, church in the air, I'm like, oh yeah, that, that guy's, good. can I tell you, that's wrong of me. I haven't checked out the facts. I don't know that situation. I don't know that person. And I would say, I think most of the lies about the pastors, the good pastors there, are lies. And they're coming from God's own people. Don't believe it. If someone comes to you with a very negative thing about another Christian, in order to change your perception from positive to negative about me or this church or anybody, guard yourself, as Hebrews says, from the bitterness that defiles what? Many. Because what are you doing? You are allowing that evil report to keep them from obeying scripture, which says they're to go one-to-one, go privately, graciously, and quickly. When you hear all the details and someone else knows about, you know the details they have against another person before they do, you're enabling them to sin because they're not following Matthew 18, are they? So I urge all of us, if someone comes to you and says, wait a minute, that, that sounds like a kind of a pretty negative thing. Have you told that thing to this person. Well, no, I don't. I'm just kind of checking with you to make sure it's a legitimate Matthew 18. That, my friends, is an excuse. That's hogwash. You go and you say, no, I should not know about this before the person. I'm not going to enable you to not follow scripture. You go to them privately, grace and quickly. After you've done that, you come back to me. If we would all do that, because otherwise, we are kind of falling into the Pharisees at hominid attacks against God. But look at the definition. An evil report involves a distortion of facts, incomplete facts, or false information. It is given with wrong motivations and causes the hearers to come to inaccurate conclusions and to respond with unscriptural solutions. Evil reports are so destructive that they can even destroy long-lasting, close friendships. As Proverbs 16 says, a whisper separateth close friends. Can I say to you, we all struggle with this. I struggle with this. None of you are immune from the gospel and slander, temptation. Not I or Marissa or anybody else. We need to work on this. But if we will work on this, we will be a close and productive and effective evangelizing church. Amen? Because what more can the unbeliever then use as excuse from evangelists say, these people gossip and slander and are at each other's heart just as much as the world. That's all bogus, this Christianity thing. So much for this love one another as I have loved you thing. Guard your hearts. Third, fourth, effective evangelism requires caring and having compassion for the lost. That's why we see, let's read it again. Jesus going throughout all the villages, preaching the kingdom of God, healing all the sicknesses and diseases. Verse 36, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Beseech the Lord of the harvest that therefore send out workers in his harvest. MacArthur writes, Jesus had banished illness in an unprecedented healing display, giving impressive evidence of his deity and making the Jews' rejection all the more heinous. He, he was moved with compassion. Here, the, hum, the humanity of Christ allowed expression of his attitude towards sinners in terms of human passion. He was moved with compassion. 
Whereas God, who is immutable, it says, um, and so it says Christ, who was fully human with all faculties of humanity, was on occasion moved to literally tears over the plight of sinners. Remember when he said, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, oh, that I long to gather you as a, as a mother hen with her chicks, but you were unwilling. Do you have that kind of heart? And then you see that he saw they were weary and scattered. The people's spiritual needs were even more desperate than the need for physical healing. And he would meet that need and ask that we meet that need by praying that God sends out more laborers into his harvest. So we need to pray that we are about God's plan. The greatest sermon I ever heard was by an evangelist at a church in California. And he reminded me of the story of Pastor John Harper during the 1917 or 18 Titanic uh, thing here. It says, John Harper was born to a solid Christian parents on May 29, 1872. It was on the last Sunday of March 1886 when he was 13 years old that he confessed Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He never knew what it was like to sow his wild oats. That's good. That's true for many of us who grew up in Christian homes. Praise the Lord. Sometimes the greatest testimony isn't what Christ saved you from or out of. It's what he saved you from even to the beginning with. Amen. And he began to preach about four years later at the ripe old age of 17. And it says that he would go down in the streets of his village and pour out his heart, his soul, in earnest treaty for men to be reconciled to God. As Harper's life unfolded, one thing was apparent. He was consumed by the word of God. When asked by various ministers what his doctrine consisted of, he was known to reply, the word of God. After five or six years of toiling on the street corners, preaching the gospel and working in the mill during the day, Harper was taken in by Reverend E.A. Carter of Baptist Pioneer Mission in London, England. This set Harper free to devote his whole time of energy to the, to the work so dear to his heart, evangelism. Soon, John Harper started his own church in September of 1896, what is known as Harper Memorial Church there still in England today. This church, which John Harper had started with just 25 members, had grown to over 500 members when he left 13 years later. During this time, he had gotten married, but was shortly there, thereafter widowed. Talk about pushback and, and temptation and heart, hardship. However brief his marriage, God did enable little John Harper with a beautiful little girl named Nana. Ironically, John Harper almost drowned several times during his life. When he was two and a half years of age, he almost drowned when he fell into a well, but was resuscitated by his mother. At the age of 26, he was swept out to sea by a reverse current and barely survived. And at age 32, he faced death on a leaking ship in the Mediterranean. Perhaps God used these experiences to prepare a servant for what he faced next. It was the night of April 14, 1912. I was off of my date earlier. The RMS Titanic sailed swiftly on the bitterly cold ocean waters, heading unknowingly into the, into the pages of history. On board this luxury ocean liner were many rich and famous people. At the time of the ship's launch, it was the world's largest man-made movable object. At 11.40 p.m. on that fateful night, an iceberg scraped the ship's starboard side, showering the deck with ice and ripping open six watertight compartments. The sea poured in. On board the ship that night was John Harper and his much-beloved six-year-old daughter, Nana. According to the document reports, as soon as it was apparent that the ship was going to sink, John Harper immediately took his daughter to a lifeboat. It is reasonable to assume that this widowed preacher could have easily gotten on board this boat to safety. However, it seemed to have, uh, uh, it says, however, he bent down and kissed this precious little girl. Looking into her eyes, he told her that she would see him again someday. The flares going off in the dark sky have reflected, should, perhaps reflected the tears of his face as he turned and headed towards the crowd of desperate humanity on the sinking ocean liner. As the rear of the, sh of the huge ship began to lurch upwards, it was reported that Harper was seen making his way up the deck yelling, women, children, and unsaved into the lifeboats. It was only minutes later that Titanic began to rumble deep within. Most people thought it was an explosion. Actually, the huge ship was literally breaking in half. At this point, many people jumped off the decks and into the icy dark waters below. John Harper was one of these people. That night, 15, uh, that night, uh, 1,528 people went into the fridge of waters. John Harper was seen swimming frantically to people in the water, leading them to Jesus before the hy their hypothermia turned fatal. Mr. Harper swam up to one young man who had climbed onto a piece of debris. Reverend Harper asked the man between breaths, Are you saved? The young man replied he was not. Harper then tried to lead him to Christ, only to have the young man who was near shock reply, No. John Harper then took off his life jacket and threw it to the man and said, Here then, you need this more than I do. 
and swam away to other people. A few minutes later, Harper swam back to the young man and success, succeeded in leading him to salvation. Of the, 15, of the 1,528 people that went in the water that night, six were rescued by the lifeboats, and one of them was the young man on the debris. Four years later, as survivors mean, this young man stood up and in tears recounted how after John Harper had led him to Christ, Mr. Harper had tried to swim back to help other people, yet because of the intense cold, he had grown too weak to swim. His last words before going under the frigid waters, according to this man, were, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. What a way to go. Does Hollywood remember this man? No. We got, we got, X-rated videos and, and, uh, and, and kind of filth that, that millions of people paid for instead. It says, no, oh well, no, uh, no matter, they say. But this writer writes, this servant God did what he had to do. While other people were trying to buy their way into the lifeboats and selfishly trying to save their own lives, John Harper gave up his life so that others could live and be saved. Greater love is no man than this, and he laid down his life for his friends. John Harper was truly the hero of the Titanic. I urge you to read the entire book called The Titanic's Last Hero by Moody Press, a great book that has encouraged my life in evangelism. Here's a real photo of that day. And the evangelist that I heard then had these words. He says, what, what is recorded in this book, so he says, is that in that time, those in the lifeboats, they said the hardest thing to forget was the screams of those who were still in the water. And he then turned the evangelist and said, he says, do you hear their cries? Do you hear the screams of the lost? He says, you may get comfortable Christians in the lifeboat of salvation. But he says, don't forget there's some who are still in the water. Do you have a compassion? Do you hear the cries of the lost? Are you going about your life as if life and eternity are not at stake for the 1,500 or the 1,000 that may be around in your life? Do you hear their cries, TBC? And lastly, the next week we will look at Effective evangelism requires risking and accepting rejection and persecution. Because as we see, Jesus is going to go into Nazareth and he's going to be rejected. He's going to be made fun of. He's going to be ridiculed. And guess what? He didn't care. And I would say to you, do you care so much about your reputation? Do you care so much what people think of you? Forgetting that you should care what God thinks of you more? Do you want so much human acceptance you're forgetting about God's acceptance? And I would say, care what God thinks of you and leave the rest to do as they may. You endure it because you know him and you love him and you are unashamed of him. And I would say to you so too often, I am ashamed, but I want us to be unashamed. One of the great newsboys, uh, old songs, by the way, is I am unashamed, the unashamed out. I want to be that kind of Christian. Because as, we, as we we're reading in Acts this week, and I close with a uh, short video, in Acts 4, we see that John and Peter go into the temple and they're arrested and they're told, stop speaking in this name. And I love what they say. They, they said, we cannot stop speaking of the things we have seen and heard. Can I say, that should be our attitude. We cannot stop speaking about the things we've seen and heard. And then they prayed, oh Lord, take note of these threats, these enemies of the cross, and all these people hate you, but they say, grant your slaves to speak your name with all confidence. That should be what we are praying about daily, because uh, my friends, you may have gained it a year ago, but I need it renewed every day. Are you like me? I need it renewed daily. Lord, grant shall Laird confidence to be unashamed of the gospel of Christ, Romans 1, because it is the power of salvation to those who believe. And it says that then, how about this? When's the last time we've had a prayer meeting so packed out that then the place where we've prayed is shaken because we've prioritized prayer over and above TV or getting to bed or our kids to bed on time because that is our priority of praying with the body of Christ. That's where the power comes in. And it says that they were filled, the place was shaking, the Holy Spirit began, and then they went out and spoke the word of God with, keyword boldness. That's what I want. I want this, this parisia, this boldness, this calmness to, to plainly and publicly be unashamed of my Lord. I want that. I want to make known the boldness of the mystery of the gospel. 
And, and, and I want you to pray for me like Ephesians 6. Paul says, pray that I may speak as boldly as I ought to speak. Pray that for your pastor. I pray that for you. Pray that as 1 Thessalonians 2 says, that we will be approved by God and not care about men who has entrusted us with the gospel, this ministry of reconciliation, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. So in conclusion, I want you to listen to, I believe, the, the most the boldest evangelist I know in our day and time. You should read his book, every one of you, called Mark Cahill. Mark Cahill uh, played uh, basketball with uh, Charles Barkley at either Alabama or Arkansas. He's witnessed to Michael Jordan, been completely rejected. He's been rejected by Barkley, but he witnesses to everything that breathes. He's the guy who puts tracks in the, in the beer containers and supermarkets. He's the guy who leaves the tracks for you in the, in the uh, bathroom stalls. And he witnesses that every, he tries to make the most of every opportunity. This is what my brother Drew was like, and it was annoying, I'll be honest with you. But only from a selfish, humanly perspective. I want you to listen to this five-minute excerpt I found this week of him, in conclusion, speaking to Cedarville University and, and, and the song, Rescue the Perishing. Please take a listen and just allow and pray during this time. Lord, how can I improve my witness to you. If your dream is to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, trust me, death beats life. Do you believe hell's a real place? If you believe hell's a real place, you can never ask yourself the question, how can I share my faith with that person? The only question you can ask yourself is, how can I not share my faith with that person? Do you know there's people in hell wishing and wanting that you would tell somebody the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ? People in heaven believe in personal evangelism. People in hell believe in personal evangelism. But what is sad today, born-again believers in Jesus Christ on planet Earth today don't believe in personal evangelism. Every second, seven people die. By the time you put your head on your pillow tonight, over 600,000 people have walked off into eternity. Heaven or hell as we speak. Got a very simple question for you. Do you care? Much tougher question, though. Do you care enough to do something about it? Because trust me on the simple fact, if you do not care enough to do something about it, trust me, you do not care. And I'll go ahead and tell you, that's the problem we got with the American church today. We swear to the high heavens we care where all these people are going to spend eternity, but I don't care enough to get in a conversation with my next door neighbor, with one of my friends from high school. Think about that. What's it going to take if you get out of your comfort zone? What have we done? We've, we've formed a type of Christianity that did not exist 2,000 years ago. We've made sharing our faith an optional part of Christianity. It was never an optional part. It was what we were living for to see six billion people saved. Does your heart beat that way? What's it going to take to get out of your comfort zone? You want a heavy piece of truth? Here's a heavy piece of truth. I can guarantee you one thing that you can't do in heaven that you can do down here. You can worship God in heaven. You can praise God in heaven. You can sing songs to God in heaven. You can read your Bible in heaven. But one thing you can't do in heaven that you can do down here is share your faith with a non-believer. Okay, why? There's no non-believers there. Do you know from the day you die to the end of eternity and there is no end of eternity, you'll never, ever, ever be able to share your faith with a lost person again? If that's true and you know it's true, shouldn't that be one of the high callings of our life is to reach out to all these lost people? Do you understand when I take my last breath with this body, I will never talk with a lost person again for all of eternity? That's a heavy piece of truth. Haven't you been comforted by the blood of Jesus Christ? Have you not been? Or are you just going to sit here and sing songs about it while there's an entire world out there with so much pain in their life and you've got the answer to it and you will not give it away to these people? If you're not out of your comfort zone, I'm about to challenge you to get out of it, okay? And to stay out of it. I'm crazy. Okay, I'm crazy. I'm getting crazier in a biblical way. I want six billion people saved. And it's not going to happen unless all of us who claim the name of Jesus Christ walk in and stand up for what we believe. Does that make sense? You can 
swear to the high heavens you care, but if you don't care enough to talk with somebody, trust me, you do not care. There's people at gay and lesbian festivals that need so desperately to hear from you. There's people at Antioch that so desperately need to hear from you. And you're keeping it to yourself. Selfish. You gotta be selfless. If you have some serious questions to ask yourself, you're still gonna keep living the same old, same old mediocre Christian life, Mark Cahill. You're gonna start getting out of your comfort zone and start serving the God of this universe like you're supposed to. I had some serious questions to ask myself. And that's one of the defining characteristics in my life to get out of my comfort zone and start standing up for what I believe no matter what the cost. Is there a cost when you stand up for it? Is there a cost when you stand up for it? You better believe there's a cost for it. Jesus Christ knew it, but he knew his dad was worth it. The question is, when, I'm, when am I going to get to the point that I know my God is worth it? No matter what the cost. If I can't witness out there and I can only witness down here, what's the only way we'll ever get good at is what? Practice, because it's not a gift. It's just an issue of obedience or disobedience. It's not a gift. It's just an issue of obedience or disobedience. We plant, we water, only God gives the increase. Real simple. Death means just the beginning. It's just the beginning in a place called heaven or just the beginning in a place called hell. So always remember that the people you go to a funeral, they're not dead, they're alive. The question is where are they and who warned them? Who spoke truth into their life and do that? Snatch people from the fire and do not let them go to hell. You snatch them back and don't let them go there. The question is when you walk out of here, where are you going? When you die, you don't get a do-over, you don't get a mulligan, you don't get a second chance. Die with no regrets. Obey the Lord Jesus Christ in everything he says to do before you take your last breath. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He takes none. We need to stand up and be bold. A hundred years now, we're all dead anyways. We're all dead. Understand what matters. Souls matter to God, yes or no? It was proven on the cross 2,000 years ago. Your job is to warn people. It's their choice what to do. But if you love somebody, trust me, you'll blow the trumpet loud and long and hard, okay, and snatch them from the fire. Do not let them take a last breath without the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that you would uh, just give me boldness, that I cannot stop speaking about the things that I've heard and seen. I pray that you'd help me and everyone here not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is a power and a salvation for those who believe. Forgive us, Lord, of being timid like Timothy at times. So we ask you to take us forth from this place, Lord, and truly bold, Lord, that we would be bold for you and ashamed of you and fruitful for you. Lord, make us effective evangelists where all of us are equipped, Lord, to be fully utilized in evangelism and that we would see it as all of our duties, not just some, but all. Equip this entire church. And Lord, we just pray you would help us to be a small reflection of the book of Acts in the early church to see that you were continually adding to our number, TBC's number, those who are daily being saved. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.